It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. What good is a dead body? What kind of work do dead bodies do? And how have humans cared for dead bodies through the ages? And why do we do it? What do dead bodies tell us about the things we value most and about the things we're afraid of? All of us will be dead someday, so these questions are relevant for everyone. Cultural historian Thomas LaCour has dug into records, both ancient and contemporary, in order to answer these questions in his new book, The Work of the Dead, A Cultural History of Mortal Remains. In this episode, LaCour joins us to tell the story of how the churchyard became the dominant resting place of the dead during the Middle Ages, and then we'll trace the rise of the cemetery that we're more familiar with today. We'll also talk about why people gather the names of the dead on great lists and memorials, something ancient people seldom did. It's Thomas LaCour talking about the work of the dead on the Maxwell Institute podcast. Questions and comments about this and other episodes can be sent to mipodcast at byu.edu. And if you have a moment, please go to iTunes and rate and review the show. And let your friends know that you listen to the Maxwell Institute podcast. Thomas LaCour, welcome to the Maxwell Institute podcast. It's good to be with you. It's good to be with you. Thank you. And you're joining us today from California, right near the University of California, Berkeley? Yes, I'm at my house, just a mile north of campus. And we're talking about this really interesting book that you recently put out called The Work of the Dead, and we're talking about dead bodies, basically. Uh, let's actually start off with some current events, something that just happened in New York City. A scandal just broke out in May of this year, 2016, uh, just months after your book was published. And I was interested to hear your reaction when you heard that bodies, which had been donated to the New York University School of Medicine, were not cremated and laid to rest in a dignified manner, as the school had promised, but were instead sent to the city of New York as being unclaimed, and many of them were buried in mass graves at Hart Island with other unclaimed or uh, indigent bodies. What did you think when you saw this news come out? Well, I thought it was um, a part of of an older contemporary story, and that turned a part of an even older story. So you might remember that uh, some urns from a mental asylum in Oregon had gone missing some number of years ago. And uh, again, some years ago, I think it was in Georgia uh, that some cremated re- remains were just found leaking in, in a warehouse somewhere. So this is, in some sense, uh, a longer story of how institutions mistreat, or should I say, um, dismiss the remains of people um, perhaps they shouldn't dismiss who should be treated as people rather than as animals or as just detritus. And so, in a way, it's part of the story of how our our culture, in some sense, demands of itself that everyone be treated as human. And it's not a standard to which we always rise, um, but it's a standard to which we hold ourselves. And I think today, right now, issues of inequality uh, are very much in the public eye and issues of, of the treatment of the poor, or of the, in this case of NYU may not be the poor, some of them aren't poor at all, um, yeah. but but of, of people who uh, sort of give themselves over to institutions um, and then are, are kind of, uh, are sort of, are, are, are wiped clean of their humanity. And I think that's the, that's the issue, and I think that's why it's so important now, and as you, as you mentioned, Hart Island, um, the idea of, of allowing people to visit Hart Island has now become important, and the city of New York is now making this this possible. And there are all sorts of efforts to identify over a century's worth of bodies there and produce lists. You can see these now online. So I think it's part of a larger, the scandal is part of a larger and longer process in which we want to insist on the humanity of the dead. There, yeah, there are deep feelings that it shows that it's it's unquestioned in the reporting that uh, that this sort of thing shouldn't happen. Nobody's wondering, you know, well, maybe it's okay. I mean, it's pretty well the consensus is firm that yes, this, right, right, um, and 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 my book is about is, is about in some sense, you know, how in some sense how natural that is, and yet how strange it is. The New York Times article um, that I'll link to on the blog uh, quotes an anatomy professor. He spent part of his career overseeing anatomical donations at another school. He said he was he was sickened to learn what had gone on, and I immediately thought of your book when I when I read this quote in the New York Times. He said. This is so out of line with common practice. The idea of it is so disrespectful. But every time you turn around, you're going to find some people who are taking advantage of their access to the dead because they know the dead are not going to talk. 
That's his quote. The dead aren't going to talk. And on the surface, everybody would agree this is strictly true, but your book is called The Work of the Dead, and you argue in great detail that the dead are in many ways still with us, that they do in some sense speak, that in, in they actually perform work. This is going to be an unusual thing for people to wrap their heads around, so talk about that. It, is, it is a weird idea. It is a weird idea, but so is, of course, the, the dead talking. You know, St. Paul said, though the dead be silent, yet they speak. So the idea that the dead speak, not as ghosts or as the revenant, but the dead speak in other ways to us is, a, is an idea that goes back to biblical times and before. So uh, so the, what is this idea of the dead working? So I, I'm i not an idiot. I understand that dead bones, uh, ashes, don't literally do work in the way that you learn in a physics class where you can put a weight on a spring and have it move something. So that's not what I mean. Um, what I mean, though, is that, um, and I also understand that it's the living that do things to the dead or don't do things to the dead. I mean, so at NYU is bringing the bodies to so respectful or they're not. So that's all pretty clear. On the other hand, on the other hand, um, collections of dead bodies or the names of dead bodies or the ashes of dead bodies um, do real cultural work for us. They produce a community for us in in deep time. And it and you have to have the deep body. In other words, if you were told to Gettysburg, hey, there are no bodies there at all under the ground, people wouldn't go to Gettysburg or the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier or your family plot. Or if you learned that all the names in your genealogy was were Mormon genealogies were fake, it would be it would be a huge just cultural rupture. So we need the dead to actually be there. And that's what I mean by the the work of the dead. And so I think of phrases like the banished poet Lorca's line that nowhere in the world are the dead more alive than in Spain. And that's the kind of thing I'm trying to get at. One of the things you point out too, this is kind of pushing back against the idea that, you know, I think people may still go to Gettysburg and maybe you would too. And I'm thinking of the Vietnam uh, memorial that doesn't have any bodies there. And you talk about this in the book that the names themselves can turn to substitutes. Um, right. No, no. I, I take the point that you don't always need to have bodies. And I think names are crucial. But what's interesting to me is that people speak to these names as if they were there. It's a bit like you're reading to me that the dead can't speak. Well, the dead sort of can speak. And in some sense, we know they can't listen, but yet we think they listen. If you go to the Vietnam Memorial, which I was just there a few weeks ago, one sees all sorts of people there talking to the dead. They're standing in front of a name and they're talking to the name and they're leaving a note at the name or they're leaving a pack of cigarettes at the name. Well, you could say, you could make up all kinds of stories, but somehow someone is believed to be present there. And there's a communication, and a communication does cultural work. It's tying us to someone of the past, to a grandfather, to a brother. And that's what I mean by the, and the collectivity of these names do something for us as a nation. So that's what I'm getting at. It's this, it's this, to me, at least, strange enchantment. Um, at the same time, when we understand, we by mean people who are religious and not religious, that in some literal way, the dead aren't there. They're just not. And yet all of us believe in one fashion or the other that they are there. And that's what the book is really about. And and I want to say, this being a program in some sense about the Center for Study of Religion, that we believe the dead to be there and we believe the dead to speak in some ways not irrespective of what we actually what our faith is, but cross faith and no faith. And that was one of the discoveries of my of my research. Yeah, you actually sort of put um, belief about the dead as as actually sort of a subcategory that could include all religions, no religions. That it's something right. sort of sub-religion, not in an well, inferior well, way, sub, but it, exactly it, not yeah. in an inferior way, but in a foundational way. Yeah, that is to say, it's it's the kind of it's the kind of feeling of all we have in the world of which some people build religious views and some people build not religious views, but it's, it's, it's foundation. I'd say foundational rather than, I think it's what you mean by sub, yeah. but that's, 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 it's a foundational belief of humans is what I want to argue. Exactly. And you, you trace it back to deep time uh, and you bring it 
your book is structured such that some of it talks about ancient history and then the the majority of the book talks about the work performed by mortal remains in Western Europe since the 18th century, especially in England. But as you reach back into deep time to set the stage, you find that many thinkers have understood burial practices as one of the things that raised humans out of nature into culture. Right, exactly. Well, um, you, you, you put your finger, finger on it. I mean, uh, all sorts of people have had you want to call origin myths, if you will, about um, burying the dead. So there's a Jewish tradition in which uh, it was birds that taught Adam and Eve about burial. When Cain sue Abel, uh, in Chinese traditions going back thousands of years, it was a God's gate, people clan names so they could remember the dead of their, of their clan. Uh, some Greek thinkers thought when the ancient gods quit eating the dead, as the giants did, we came to the era of the Olympic gods and our world, the world of man. Um, and I think you find Native American stories like that. So there's, there's a sort of, there's a, I think, I don't, wouldn't say universal, but there's a very wide set of origin stories in which the dead are, are the beginning of something human. And if, after all the biblical story, it's the coming of death that, basically our entry into, I mean, consequence of, of original sin, but it's our entry into death, which makes us human. So that's the kind of deep, deep time I want to talk about. And, and I think paleoanthropologists um, have, are discovering that, that people very far into, into the, into the, in our history, 50, 60,000 years ago, seem to have been burying. So in some sense, I want to say to be human is to care for their dead. And that's been theorized since people started theorizing about what it was to be human, which is probably roughly a thousand before the common era, um, and continues up through the enlightenment thinkers and all sorts of people who theorize about, well, what makes us human? And I think you find this in, other, in all sorts of religious traditions. Um, so that's what I'm trying to argue, the deep time part. I don't, I can't, I don't think there is an answer to why do we do it? in the sense of an evolutionary answer, or we do it because we're human and that is what we've always done. And that's kind of an originary moment is what I want to argue. And that's as far down as we can get. Yeah, it's, a, you know, it's you know, in, a, in a sense, it's almost a circular argument, but it's, it's I don't see a way around that because yeah, by definition, it's like the human but, is, but, this marks that I transition. Suggest is that I don't think there's much to be added by sort of a, a Darwinian uh, just so story says, well, we do it because it produces group solidarity. Well, okay, it produces group solidarity, but do we think there's a gene for it? There's a selection for it? I, don't, I mean, possibly, but no one, I'm not sure that gives you a lot better answer than the circular answer. You yeah, know? And and then the question, why do we, why does that get selected? And then you have another set of questions. So, you know, I think, you know, there's an expression is turtles all the way down. Yeah, I was thinking at that. Point, at some point. It's corpses it's, all the way it's down. It's corpses right? all the way down, right, exactly. <laughs> That's Thomas W. LaCour. He's the Helen Fawcett Professor of History at the University of California, Berkeley. He's written a number of books on the human body and gender and religion. His latest book is The Work of the Dead, A Cultural History of Mortal Remains. Um, so almost two and a half thousand years ago, just before the rise of Christianity, there's a philosopher called Diogenes, and he made an unusual declaration that you begin the book with and, and return to it again and again right. um, as sort of uh, the minority position on the dead. So right. he tried to set an example that humans have been resisting and resisting quite easily ever since. Um, Cicero records this story. He says, Diogenes the cynic ordered himself to be thrown anywhere without being buried. And when his friends replied, what to the birds and beasts? Uh, and Diogenes said, by no means. Place my staff near me that I may drive them away. And his friends said, how can you do that? For you will not perceive them. And Diogenes says, how am I then injured by being torn by those animals if I have no sensations? He says, just toss my body over the wall. Right. Uh, how is that shaken out over time? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, everyone says right on Diogenes, uh, very good point. And uh, the, the church fathers said, well, of course he's right. He isn't, so we don't believe in all these silly things that the pagans believed in where it makes a difference where you're buried. And if you're not buried in the right place, your shades will wander the earth and you won't come to peace. We don't believe this kind of stuff. We Christians believe that wherever your body is, God can resurrect us from the, from the ashes. But on the other hand, it's it's important to be buried near a saint. And 
it actually sort of matters. And or it's important to be buried in a churchyard. Um, or some other story is important to be buried. Or I mean, every religion has a different version of the story. So everyone will say, well, of course it's just a dead body, and of course if God can do whatever God wants to do in terms of raising the dead or in terms of transmigrating a soul. And that's the point of having a very powerful God. On the other hand, we don't live with it. So that's what you're saying. Everyone has said there's a big point. Good Diogenes has a point, and it, it avoids idolatry. It avoids trying to think we're bribing God by somehow doing something with the dead and so forth. On the other hand, we as humans bury our dead, and we've never not been able to do it. So that's Diogenes is my foil because over two and a half centuries, this deeply acultural view. And after all, Diogenes, you have to remember Diogenes was really the famous, the most famous bad boy of, uh, of antiquity. Yeah. I mean, Plato thought Diogenes was sort of Socrates gone crazy. Where we, and he, what he means by that is that, look, Socrates was against uh, accepting what he took to be the irrational conventions of society. So Socrates got in a lot of trouble in Athens for corrupting the young. But if, when they asked him to take poison, he didn't escape. He said, okay, I get the we live in a certain culture of law and I have to follow the law. And he took the poison and and Socrates in some sense acted like a man within culture. Diogenes takes it a step further and says, the hell with culture. So he was the guy that famously lived in a barrel. He was a street person, right? That's the guy who lived in a barrel. When Alexander the Great came by and says, what can I do for you? He said, you can get out of my light. Yeah, uh, you're blocking the sun. <laughs> yeah, he was. A, you were blocking the sun. He was a forger. Um, and and he's called the cynic or the dog philosopher because he lived like a dog, which is living in nature. So Diogenes, this is an explicitly bad boy dog position, which everyone says, well, yeah, dogs are good living in nature, but we live in culture. So that's why Diogenes is so central to me, because it really is about living in, a, living in the world with our fellow man rather than living like a dog. And so Diogenes comes up again and again as sort of the uh, counterpoint to all of the effort and time that goes into care of the body, because rather right. than just tossing bodies over the wall, uh, the things that humans do with, with their dead involve a lot of labor, a lot of time, a lot of attention, a lot of care. And right. when things don't go well, like we've seen in this recent example in New York City, people are upset by that. So right. part two of your book, uh, once we get past the deep time stuff, shifts to more recent times. You're looking especially at the rise of of Christian graveyard, the church graveyard, and then the later emergence of the more cosmopolitan cemetery. So you trace a uh, development from church graveyard to cemetery. And there's a sweeping paragraph at the beginning that talks about the specific ways that people put bodies into the ground. They put them horizontally, direction, you know, it's facing different directions. What are some examples from different cultures? One thing that struck me was they don't find examples of people burying someone like uh, standing straight up or like you know, on their heads or right. anything like that. Few people. I mean, it's it's a joke when you stand people on their on their heads. I mean, you know, in in uh, so it, it's it's what you it's what you do when you you know in strange places. Swift talks about people being buried on their heads. It's what weird people do. So so what I wanted to say in general is I want to say that all peoples do something with their dead and they do it in a careful way. And the reason I then want to focus is you say mostly on Western Europe, though not entirely, and then in England, is that the dead do work in very specific in very specific places. So, in other words, antiquity cared for the dead, the names of the dead, but they care for it in different ways than the than your church cares for the names of the dead. And so if one's going to explain this, one has to explain it your story or the ancient story in a particular place. So what I want to try to, what the structure of the book is really to make these general arguments and they say, well, let's see how they work somewhere. And I happen to know mostly about Western Europe, but I think someone could make this about how the Chinese bury their dead. They don't bury them east, west, but they bury them in a relationship to certain geomantically produced lines. And they're specialists who go around and help people know where to place the dead. So they're, you don't just put them anywhere in the fields. You put them in certain places and the people who tell you which kind of places to put them in. And so my story is that the churchyard of the cemetery, which you asked me about, is that um, in some sense that there was a churchyard, if you want to say, before there was a church, which is to say the ancient Christians came to bury their dead around the martyrs. And these martyrs, they became martyr churches. And they were 
in warm climates is around the Mediterranean. They didn't have roofs. They were sometimes just walls around a grave and then around other graves. So the early Christians were, were worshipped in a very specific way in a graveyard, which then became a church. And then a building came to be built there in the 5th, 6th century, depending on where you are. So, so, the, so the churchyard and the church it grows out of a, what I call a necrogeography, a geography of dead bodies. So rather than having the dead body be outside the city, um, what came to happen is that first these martyr sites were outside cities, but then people started moving the bones of the martyrs inside cities. And then churches were built around these, and then more of the dead came to be gathered around them. And the church and the churchyard became the center of the city in Western, in Europe, rather than being at the periphery of the city. So that's the kind of story I want to tell. And so that churchyard and those things in the middle of the city is that community of Christians over time. This is where we are. Walk into church, where are our ancestors? They're there. This is what really surprised me. It seemed as though you, you made a case that church, so church, cha even churches today, so chapels, buildings set apart for worship and this sort of thing right. can be traced genealogically back to burial practices. And this is because early Christianity had house churches where people would meet in homes and things like this. Right. They didn't have their own separate church buildings. And it, it seemed like you were saying that burial grounds that would be buried around a martyr or something and then a building would be constructed there eventually and so church buildings today seem to be a product of the graveyard rather than the graveyard coming to the church that's well that's exactly right but after a while of course you could do it both ways you could build a church in the, in a village or in the city and then move the dead to that village so saint ambrose built the church in milan and then he moved into the, uh, the, the body of a martyr, right? So, so I mean, we're talking we're talking the late third, early fourth centuries when these martyr churches came to be built at the edge of cities, and then the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh century when bodies came to be martyrs' bodies came to be moved inside of cities. But yes, you're right. It's a good point. The church begins as a place for the dead, and the tr interesting thing to me which I didn't expect, is it continues to be the case, even when people want to start arguing, like, it's crazy to have a church around the the dead. So the Reformation, they said, well, of course you don't want need to be around a dead person. That's rank superstition. That is because the church makes money off of having us do all this stuff. Terrible, stupid. Does anything change? It does not. People quit, keep bearing around churches and inside churches. Inside churches too, inside yeah. Inside churches, big time. Under pews, than, right? Like under the pew, and, and more than before. Yeah, and yeah. so you say, well, really? Why? Since you purport to believe that it makes no difference. And the interesting thing to me too, it's true of, you know, of real serious Protestants. They also, so these bodies come to mean something. So the Wesleyan preacher Whitfield is buried in Newburyport in, in, near Boston. And revolutionary war soldiers used to go buy his body and sort of rub his skull as a way of gaining some sort of blessing for their success in battle. Boy, if you press these Puritans about what the theology, they, they would start blithering. You know, it's kind of crazy. And Calvin but, wanted to be buried uh, in an unmarked okay. grave. None of that. And so did Luther. Luther's to bury me in a meadow. None of it happened because mm -hmm. people. What, but when they finally got cemeteries, it was for different sets of reasons. So, so you're absolutely right. The genealogy of the of the church is the is the dead. So first they were the dead. Then there was the church, and then then you could once you have that established, then you could build a church, reverse the order, build the church, move in the dead. But the church and the dead were intimately connected right through the 18th century. And I thought everywhere, it was... everywhere in, not just in Western Europe, but in Eastern Europe and in Northern Europe. And basically, what? Well, yeah. And I thought it was interesting too, you talk about the origin of the term cemetery. And cemetery, as we'll talk about a little bit later on, sort of became the more pluralistic, less church-connected right. burial place. But originally, cemetery, uh, I don't know how to pronounce the Greek, yeah. but it referred to a dorm, a sleeping place. Exactly. And early Christian fathers talked about it in that sense, that Christians were sleeping in Christ. And so the cemetery, uh, the dorm, the sleeping place, right. that's where that title comes from. So even that is what later became disconnected from churches originated. In churches, uh, in exactly. Churches, yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And, um, and uh, well, a lot of these things 
have these interesting origins. I mean, the the Mormon Church's interest in names obviously grows and has some connection to uh, the medieval church's collection of names in its in its um, in its monasteries. I mean, the names you prayed for, and obviously it's a different theology. But but the idea that you a place of worship collects names is a long-standing tradition. And we'll get back to that too. Um, but I want to talk first about what these early church graveyards were like. Did they have, you know, today we go into a, a cemetery and you've got nicely ordered rows, you've got headstones. A lot of cemeteries have restrictions on what the headstones can look like. But what were these earlier ones like and how did they decide where to place bodies and this sort of thing? Well, we don't know what the really early ones looked like because um, we don't have pictures. And so in that sense, the first time we sort of get picked, really pictures or engravings of church yards is not till know, the 16th and 17th century. So in that sense, it's hard to know. But what we know about when we do the archaeology of them, I mean, so that what we know is from is from archaeology. We, we, we know that there, there were very few headstones. We know that the bodies are oriented very precisely with the orientation of the church, that the church is very precisely oriented east-west very precisely. Um, people have looked into this in terms of astronomical calculations, and the churches really were oriented east-west, and the graves are oriented with the axes of the church. So the whole thing, the whole structure is east-west. We know that. We also know that we also know that it's a very small space, and that these churches were around for a very long time. Some of them 8th, ninth centuries, depending on a long time. And so we know that people kept being buried in this same ground, and there were hundreds and thousands of bodies there. So it was very lumpy and very disorganized. And we know that periodically, every few hundred years, um, people would just level it, and the bones would be put in a charnel house. Now, some Christian traditions, the Greek Orthodox, um, do secondary burials. So they would dig them up after a shorter amount of time. But in most of the West, the Western Church, um, they would just level it. So archaeologists who look at these finds, they find layers of uh, bones, scraping, bones, scraping, and sometimes three and four meters above the original level of the soil. So they're not at all like the cemetery with its neat rows and so forth. They're kind of a mess. Um, and by the time we start getting pictures of these in the 17th century and then a lot in the 18th century, they're really messy and everyone's always complaining that they're messy. And even in the Middle Ages, we have some evidence constant evidence that there are pigs grazing there, there are sheep grazing there, people are selling stuff in the church here. It's just uh, people are familiar with the dead. Um, it's This is our gang. Um, and um, Your parish church would be where you were buried. Like it's Absolutely. Yeah. And to not be buried in the parish church was the worst possible, um, the worst possible uh, 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 punishment. And we now know, because a former student here wrote a really interesting book about this, for example, that the, the, the church in 16th century France, this would be the Roman church, got into debt collecting into, um, and running these courts. And one of their punishments is, well, you don't pay up on this debt. It's excommunication for you. And boy, that got people to pay. And it was kind of, you think it's, it's ridiculous. And it, obviously it was an abuse and people made a lot about that was abuse. But there you are. If you really want to, if you don't kneecap them, you keep them out of the, you keep them out of the the churchyard. So it's, that's the, to be tossed out of the churchyard was horrible. It was just being saying, I'm, it's like this New York story, only much worse because everyone you know is in the churchyard. It's um, one of the precipitating factors that you identify as you trace the shift from what you call the old regime, which was centered around the churchyard to the new regime, which was, um, focused on the cemetery. So there's this question of who's in and who's out, exactly. uh, heretics and people like this. There were some f very famous cases. What are, give an right. example of a famous case. Well, the most famous case, the most famous case is Voltaire. So the great anti-clerical philosopher of the Enlightenment, and maybe the most famous, you know, Enlightenment thinker, philosoph. And uh, he was all his life afraid of being tossed into the ditch. As a young man, he took up the cause of an opera singer who, because she was an opera singer, wasn't buried in a churchyard. And he wrote about this and it took it to be a scandal. So when he was dying, um, a negotiation took place about, so what would he have to do to actually get into a churchyard? And it turns out that almost every major philosopher had this kind of negotiation with the church. They were mostly in France. France had only one place to be buried, which was the Catholic Church. And so they were endlessly negotiating this. And so 
okay, would you have to take your last communion? Would you have to have a confession? Um, would you have to renounce your views? What exactly would you have to do? And they really so, focused on the deathbed. Like everybody wanted to know, like, the did he plead for mercy on his deathbed and renounce his atheism? Or yeah, then, then you were fine. You might come here. So the question with Voltaire was, did he? What kind of death did he have? And did he comply? And some say he didn't, and some say he. The negotiations fell apart. Basically, what happened is some he or he his friends had negotiated with the higher ups that he would have to do a certain amount of minimal stuff, and then the local clergyman wasn't in on this negotiation. Came in and tried to push him to do some more, and he refused or didn't refuse, depending on what you say. But in any case, he wasn't going to bury his body, and his friends then sneaked the body away and buried it privately in a monastic churchyard, which his nephew had had some access to. But this this was a huge controversy and. News about it was translated in many languages and the scores of pamphlets on the subject. But he wasn't the only one. And then, of course, there was the question of Protestants in a Catholic country. So if you died as a Protestant in France, you were in trouble. So Rousseau was the most famous of these Protestants. And Rousseau, the, one of the most famous authors of the 18th century, couldn't be buried decently. So a friend buried him in a garden, which was like the garden in one of his novels, and his tomb then became a kind of pilgrimage site. But ordinary merchants who were there, where would they be buried? What about British merchants in Lisbon who were died in the port trade, in the cherry trade, and so forth? And so people said, look, we should be more open. And the example was in the East, in Gujarat, on the Indian coast, all sorts of people were buried together. You didn't have to be religious. The Muslims were buried there, and Jews were buried there, and Christians were buried there. And that's what we should be doing in Europe, say they. And the cemetery is this kind of cosmopolitan place, like they have in the East in these commercial centers. It's really it's, fascinating how you trace this, because there's a lot of different factors, and you bring in a lot of different... Um, stories from history that sort of showed the decline of the old regime. So we've talked about kind of practical considerations like space. So yeah. that was a problem. We yeah. talked about religious questions. There were public controversies and people started questioning, well, why is the church? They were uncomfortable with the with the church being able to arbitrate these things. Right. Uh, exactly. And not just for celebrities, but also there were, uh, in the 1880s or 1870s to 1880, uh, a very public controversy over an unbaptized child right. as well. Absolutely. Well, I mean, every again, every country has a different story about this. I mean, the American case, sadly, could black people be buried in white people's cemeteries? Could black veterans be buried with, with white veterans? And so it's all about what kind of community can Jews who have been um, cremated be buried in a Jewish cemetery? So some version of, of a kind of story is all about gatekeeping. Yeah. But you ask about the British case. So the Britain, as you know, has a national church, the Church of England. And um, the national church, so each of these churches, churchyards are under the, uh, 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 under the care of a clergyman. And there are sort of general rules as to who gets into a churchyard. And so the answer is baptism. But how you understand baptism could be anyone's argument. So everyone historically has understood, well, baptism, is anyone saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? It can be with sand, it can be with water, um, it, possibly sand, it can be done by a layperson, it is generally thought, and so forth. But some of the Church of England clergymen said, well, no, the only proper baptism, the only real Christian is people who have been baptized by us, not by Methodists, not by Baptists, not by Presbyterians, by us. So they excluded those people. Well, then it becomes the case, well, what about Baptist kids who aren't baptized? I mean, until they're, until they're, until they're older. Well, some people argued, look, the churchyard really isn't belonging just to this theoc theocratically run church. It belongs to the, to the nation. It's the nation's burial place. It belongs to the parish. And some of the most conservative clergymen says, no, if we actually acknowledge that the, it belongs to the parish as a whole, Rather than to the Christian community of the parish, we're basically giving up on the idea of a national, of a unified national church and of the union of church and state. And that's what happened in the late 19th century. Pretty much every country gives up on the idea of a of a of a national of a church that's intimately bound with a with a state. So we theocracy probably died or depends on when you believe theocracy ended, but giving but losing the monopoly on burial places in England, it really is the end of the old 
definitive end of the old theocratic regime if it didn't happen before. So that's the interesting. So that's that case. But in some sense, you could argue in America, letting the letting black people be buried with white people is sort of the ultimate end of segregation. So each of, that's what I mean by work of the dead. The dead kind of put a line under that. No, we don't. We we are all part of this country. Yeah, that's the cultural it's, work that, that it's the culture work that they do, and it's pretty important. Yeah. Um, um, another thing that we haven't touched on yet that made a big difference. Uh, so we see the old regime sort of cracking. Uh, there are problems with this. Uh, right. You're you're going to need something to replace or supplement right, it. Right, if, right, if, and right. We'll get to that. But there was one other factor that became huge, and that was. Uh, changing ideas about health, and some of these were just downright silly. Talk about some of the concerns people had about health. And well, it's interesting. You know, the usual, if you ask, if you look at textbooks, why were the cemeteries created? There was, well, because everyone realizes that churchyards were dirty and terrible and so forth. Well, in real life, they're actually not so dirty. I mean, as I say, I think I say, and I saw me, doctors tell us, any given thousand live bodies is more dangerous than any given thousand dead bodies you wouldn't think that even today you would we not wouldn't think, think that, that but you know you're more like you're more i mean they don't smell what well good but you smells what does it it smell is terrible and you believe yeah. anything that smells so bad has to be make you sick but it doesn't now that doesn't mean of course that if you're in a you know, ebola epidemic you want to so hang around with the excrement of people with ebola there's certain right. special diseases where which more dangerous. but in on average if you were around in the middle of the 19th century and you had a choice between walking in with a thousand dead people and a thousand living people, you should, the rational thing would have been choose dead people. And a lot of people sort of even got that in the 19th century. On the other hand, people were arguing, as you say, all this sort of amazing stuff about all these miasmas and things miasmas, that were growing yeah. out, of, out of dead bodies and causing people to be sick. So I interpret this as not that these guys were lying, but in some sense, it's about who controls smell, as I put it. In other words, the clergy used to control the dead, and in our society, by and large, public officials and doctors control the dead. You can't bury someone these days without who, who dies un, un, uh, um, unattended, without a coroner. Cemetery, there are all these rules about what bombing and this and that, which is yeah, set yeah. by medicine. It's not really medical. I mean, they don't. It's just that's our. It's an important part of who get who runs our who runs these deep issues in our culture and by and large is doctors. I mean, the medical profession, public health. So it's what I want to argue is again, it's another part of the work of the dead. It's not because the dead are dangerous that we get cemeteries. It's because the dead are so powerful. The doctors want to have broadly speaking, doctor science wants to have dominion over the dead. So it's part of the story of getting dominion over the dead. And then they kind of make up these stories. They don't consciously make them up, but they know they're not quite right because their friends are telling him, look, it's just not a good argument. They said, well, never mind. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's so it's, interesting. I mean, the, one of the most striking parts of the book is where uh, I don't remember if you make the argument or if you're citing someone, but there's the argument that people were saying, OK, so this let's just say let's just say there are this many people that die in England in a year. Right. And here's how much they would weigh. Right. There is this much human waste produced right. um, by living humans every year, and it's exponentially larger and much more dangerous. Right. But well, that's we, me. Yet they that's focused me. on and the death. Willing to put, perfectly willing to stick around with the de with jump the, the excrement in the river, which causes yeah. all sorts of people to be call cholera. But they go crazy about these yeah. small numbers of dead bodies. And I say, well, how is that possible? It's not hypocrisy exactly. It's that it's that it's that it's part of this one wanting to hold on to the dead to do this important cultural work of of reestablishing the order of society. We're no longer a society under a priesthood. We're a society under under a rational, social, scientific, biological regime. That's what it, it was thought to be modern. Yes. And, you know, and the dead help you be modern. Yeah, so, exactly. So how do we a, get... get a version of the de work of the dead. That's Thomas LaCour. A professor at UC Berkeley whose book is called The Work of the Dead, A Cultural History of Mortal Remains. So how do we get from the church art to the cemetery? All these factors we've talked about, there are religious questions, people frustrated with the church. There were economic considerations there. The church would – There were aesthetic um, considerations. Money. Yep. There were uh, practical considerations like space. There were health right. considerations. Right. Now, while all this is going on now, there these factors led to the rise of cemeteries, which were separated from graveyards. So as, as we talk about the rise of the cemetery, this will give us an opportunity to talk about what this new regime, uh, how it differed from the 
old regime, which, as you mentioned earlier, also persisted. People are still buried in churchyards, and there's still examples of that. But the cemetery came up. So let's talk about how the cemetery came to be envisioned, the Elysian fields and this type of thing. Right. Well, that's an interesting story. You were, I mean, again, one of the things about the book that I kind of like and some people might be frustrated by is that I don't – it's never just one story. Yeah. It's never just one story. And so um, the story I want to tell is that, look, let's first just think, how do, we, how do we think about places of the dead? Well, the churchyard, everyone has in their minds. But how about something different? Well, think about antiquity. It's the Elysian Fields. It's some beautiful rural space uh, where the, the happy dead congregate. So where does it come from? Well, no one builds a freestanding mausoleum anywhere in Europe for the better part of two century, two millennia. And then the Earl of Carlisle builds the, this first freestanding monument in his, the fields of his castle. And he calls it the, the Elysian Fields. And his daughter writes a, think about, a, book about, a poem about the Elysian Fields. And then the King of Denmark decides that there's a tomb that he found in his one of his castles, and he decides to put a lot of fake graves around this park and call it Elysian Fields, though there are no actual bodies there. So now we start thinking of tombstones in Elysian Fields. And then Rousseau gets buried in a garden, and then the French Revolution comes around, and people are destroying tombs everywhere, and a man named Lenoir starts collecting these, and he sets up a museum of Elysian Fields in which he takes mines from all over France and puts them in this these fields. So now we have, and gardens of tombs become sort of popular. So all of a sudden now, rather than imagining tombs and the dead in churchyards, people start imagining them in the countryside or in fields. And then get in the French Revolution where there's the clericalism, other things going on. Someone says, okay, well, what, instead of just imagining them and having a few aristocrats, let's just build the Legion fields. So they build the Legion fields and they hire landscape architects to do it. And you start getting the cemetery as actually a planned space. So landscape architecture itself grew directly out of that. Landscape architecture and cemeteries absolutely together. And in America, of course, the most famous landscape architects like Olmsted, who gave us um, Central Park, also gave us the cemetery in Cincinnati. Um, so and, and in Oakland. So that um, so that the same guys do this. And so if you look at plans of cemeteries, they they're. It's make trivialized as either theme parks for the dead, but cemeteries have different themes. In other words, Boston's Mount Auburn was a bird sanctuary, and they wanted a place that was really kind of naturey. And Paris wanted something slightly more classical, and and uh, Highgate in London wants something slightly more Egyptian. And in Brazil, they thought, well, let's get something more like Père Lachaise. And in other places, they said, let's get something more like Mount Auburn. You know, and so people started building these very specific spaces, which were supposed to have historical illusions. And Gettysburg was meant to have connection to how the dead were buried in the Battle of Marathon plant space. So, so cemeteries become plant spaces while churchyards grew up organically over hundreds and thousands of years and weren't planned. They were just spaces around the church. So there's an aesthetic story, as you say, there's this, there's a story of space needs. There's the story of anti-clericalism and religious plurality. And all these together come producing the cemetery. I was so surprised to discover that these early Elysian fields and these examples were built. They, they built cemeteries before they ever put any bodies in them. Absolutely right. No, they had the idea. And, and you know, in England, they were commercial. So someone who joined stock companies, well, okay, we're going to buy stock in this. Then we're going to have these Elysian fields. And the... Prosperous people will buy nice tombs and will and will sell sort of hidden spaces to you know people who take care of the bodies of the poor and will make money and they did make money for a while it wasn't a good business model over the years because you ran out of resources that is out of land and they went broke after some number of decades. But instead of the church getting paid by the city or wherever to bury bodies of the poor and so forth, yeah. that money started going to these joint stock companies. Who, exactly, exactly, um, exactly, exactly. Another thing about these cemeteries is they, they, the idea of them turned much more to places of memory, 
uh, yep. contemplation. And this is reflected on engravings. Uh, how did some of the engravings differ right. between the churchyards? And started, the, well, first of all, there weren't so many tombs and churchyards, you wouldn't remember. I mean, we think of churchyards now as having a lot of, now they're preserved and we see a fair number of them, but compare the number of bodies there, there are very few tombstones. Well, I mean, I think what I say um, in a nutshell is that something the new God becomes history and memory, which is to say, um, which is to say that uh, we have a lot more engravings, for example, of willow trees and families under the willow tree, mourning and thinking about the dead person, replaces crucifix and other kind of religious uh, imagery, um, and and also. Um, the dead are gathered in the interest of some version of history or community that's outside of the, of the religious world. It isn't necessarily outside the religious world, it's not everywhere, but if you think of Gettysburg, um, the national cemetery, the cemetery starts representing the nation, and the nation's pluralistic, and, and Lincoln himself probably wasn't an atheist, but he was not a believer particularly, and the historical, the illusion, again, is marathon. So, just like the Greeks stopped the Persians, so here the Union stopped the Confederacy and saved civilization, and that's what we're reproducing. So what's interesting to me is that how people understood these places, the kind of engravings, the sort of idea that people started collecting more things like bits of hair, other sort of thing, burying some of that with the bodies. There's a whole world of, of individual family memory and of, you might call it historical memory, which gets to be gather together and and also and the cemetery all sorts of new communities are there there's the freemasons there's the elks in america you know there's all sorts of people and in europe jews get buried next to christian cemetery a little special section so this is now no longer a christian community it's a cosmopolitan community of all sorts of people which is made up of of all these different communities so that's the kind of argument that I want to that I want to make. And we're I'm telling you, we're barely scratching the surface. The book has so much more here. We're talking to Thomas LaCour. He teaches and researches history at UC Berkeley. We're talking about his cultural history of mortal remains. It's called The Work of the Dead. Let's talk about uh, names of the dead. The section of the book on names of the dead is fascinating because you trace the rise in the importance of names, tracking the names of the dead uh, and the places where the dead are buried or commemorating the dead by having a place for their name on a monument or putting that name on a gravestone or whatever. This wasn't a common practice throughout most of human history. And you bring up this short story written by a Serbian writer, a story called Encyclopedia of the Dead. And it's about a strange sect that has undertaken <laughs> the difficult and praiseworthy task of recording everything that can be recorded concerning those who com have completed their you know that. journey. Yeah. From you guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mormonism. Uh, and, and you have this really interesting uh, a couple of pages on this. How does the LDS Church figure into your analysis on names of the dead? Well, I mean, I knew about this. I was students, and of course, they're the great genealogists, and so I, 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 uh, I, uh, I, I knew about them. But look, I, I, I want to sort of, if you want to put put the the the, the Mormon Church, um, Latter-day Saints, in historicize them, and saying look, the moment when they got interested in um, the creation of this church in the nineteenth century is exactly the same time when all sorts of other people got interested in names too in collecting the names of the dead. So that's what I want to say. Doesn't and again it gets back to my general point. It's not that I want to say that everyone does it for the same reason. The more I mean obviously there's a whole theology about why the Mormons do it, which is different than why military cemeteries do it and why Père Lachaise does it. I mean so but it's part I want to try to say it's part of the same cultural moment. Um and it's a moment when I want to argue every life ends up worth having having an end that's recorded. And not recording the end of a life, which means not having a name, is thought to be um, uh, sort of unbearable and culturally unacceptable. And that's that's what I take to be. And if you think of a foundational point, and on that foundation, different people record, make different, have different stories. Um, and that's the argument I want to make. And so I think that's and that's really it. And so I try to say in history, why is it that three five percent of people in the churchyard have names? in the early 19th century and 40, 50% have it in the late 19th century. Um, and no one cares about anonymity and all of a sudden they do care about anonymity. That's why is no one's name recorded in Waterloo and everyone's recorded in the sum 100 years later. And just to interject, you mentioned Pierre Lachey, uh, Lachey just so yeah, people Pierre know Lachey, that's yeah. 
Père Lachaise, yeah. yeah, yeah. That, that's the per, uh, cemetery in Paris that became a, a template for a lot of yeah, cemeteries, yeah. kind of the first big cemetery. Trade cemetery right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things you mentioned about um, the LDS use of names is – uh, you know, the theology behind it is to perform ordinances on behalf of the dead. So uh, Latter-day Saints want to have those names. Now, uh, you notice uh, the difficulty there in terms of just sheer numbers of people who have existed versus names that can even possibly be found. And there's been an increase since around 1500 in names being recorded in general because the state began being yes, interested yes, in Yes, absolutely. Well, I mean— you- it's no accident, as I learned from your works of the, of the old church, that that's when the great surge in names happens. I mean, that's my evidence for when I excite you, you guys. And 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 that's, as you say, because this, the state consolidates um, these sort of new monarchies and others, centralization of power, effort to regain central power after the feudal ages. And part of that is keeping track of people. So the Romans had their famous censuses and and... They don't have a census in the 16th century, but every society, Western and Eastern ones, start make demanding baptismal registers, which they didn't have, wasn't demanded before. There are some, but they start demanding them. And then as more people get incorporated into the state, they too have to get names. So as Jews become citizens, Jews get names. And as everyone gets recorded, people start getting names which have to be stable. So it's no longer George from over there. But it's George Smith, and that's mandated by the state. So we actually know this is his name. And we actually have a version of what counts as a name. In other words, George is the Christian name, and that's the Adamic name. And Smith is the surname or extra name, which doesn't matter very much. And in many common law countries, it's easy to change. You can't change You can't change uh, uh, the name that actually matters, Blair, because that's the name God gave you at originally and that's not changeable so all that is is, adjudic- is adjudicated and, and propagated by by the state you're absolutely right so that's one track so the state starts making sure that everyone has a name and that it has a certain form and conforms to that form and increasingly by the 18th century you can't just name your kid anything they'd say which names you can use and then in addition to that there is sort of the rise of i want to argue the rise of a literature which, in which the names of ordinary people matter, which is to say the novel. So unlike in Shakespeare's plays where the ordinary people are just named Will or some, you know, um, <laughs> first name, people get names and they get them in a lot more places and they get them in all sorts of things. And so the, a thickening, I want to call it, of name, the culture of the name develops in the, in the 19th century. And I want to say the um, Latter-day Saints are part of that story and a product of the story of this thickening of names of a democratic church and a democratic society. So I, I try to place your story into a larger historical story of names. It was really fun. Sometimes when I read a book, I'll go check the index to see if, if Mormonism is mentioned. But on this one, I deliberately didn't because I wanted to be surprised. And then sure enough, there it was. So it was well, really... You can't, do, you can't do names without the yeah. Mormons, right? You know, you know. <laughs> That's cool. That's that's Tom LaCour. He's uh, the Helen Fawcett Professor of History at the University of California, Berkeley. He's written histories of things like Sunday school, histories of the human body and gender. His latest book is called The Work of the Dead, A Cultural History of Mortal Remains. We'll take a brief break and come back for the conclusion of the interview. Believers and scientists have wrestled for centuries over the relationship between reason and faith, science and religion. Award-winning Latter-day Saint author and biologist Stephen Peck believes reason and faith are both indispensable tools we can use to understand God's creation. Evolving Faith, Wanderings of a Mormon Biologist is a collection of essays about Mormon theology, evolution, the environment, and other issues. Stephen Peck has the mind of a scientist, the soul of a believer, and the heart of a wanderer. In Evolving Faith, he provides welcome companionship for women and men engaged in the unceasing quest for further light and knowledge. Evolving Faith is part of the Living Faith book series from the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship. To learn more about this series, go to maxwellinstitute.byu.edu slash livingfaith. Living Faith books are available at amazon.com. We're back with Thomas LaCour, a professor of history at the University of California, Berkeley, and we're talking about his book, The Work of the Dead, A Cultural History of Mortal Remains. There's 
quite a bit of information in the book about war and names of the dead. Uh, instead of covering all of it, let's talk about one particular thing. You tell a personal story about your own grandfather that involves Judaism, Germany, and World War II that's sort of symbolic of the importance of, uh, of burial practices and, and how, how communities reckon with history. So this is a World War II situation, and you went to this cemetery and found uh, and saw your grandfather's grave. Well, what really happened is you're compressing a little bit of this history, and I understand why. So what happened was that um, my parents were German Jews uh, who, um, who were forced to leave because of Hitler. And my grandfather, who I never knew, he died before Hitler, he died in 1927, was a very passionate German nationalist, as were many German Jews. And he was buried in a very spiffy, beautiful cemetery in Hamburg um, called Oldsdorf. And I knew what his grave looked like because my grandmother, who escaped and who lived with us, had a picture of it on her desk. So this grave sort of meant to me growing up. And in 1995, I visited Germany for the first time. And my wife said, look, you should take some of your father's ashes. My father never returned to Germany. You should take some of your father's ashes and put them, mix them with the ashes of your grandfather in Germany. And I said, look, that's completely ridiculous. First of all, I don't have any of my father's ashes. We put them in a flower bed in, in Virginia. And secondly, he would have thought this was crazy. My father was a very scientifically oriented, he was a pathologist, and he would have thought this was just rubbish. And she said, no, no, this will just do it. So I collected some dirt from the flower bed, which may have had some ashes in them, but of course the ashes would be no different from the fertilizer that I put in to help the flowers. But she asked me to, we took this little bag of dirt from this grave in this flower bed in Virginia, and we took them to Hamburg, and we found my grandfather's grave, and we mixed the dirt from my father's, with may have had my father's ashes in it with my grandfather's grave. You know, and I felt like I was reconciling my father to his his father. I felt like I was returning my father to Germany, which he had been terribly sad to have lost because of the Nazis. Um, and I was making something right, and I was connecting myself to all this history. And what I what I use this to say about myself is that look, I don't believe anything about this. I don't believe my father's ashes were there. I don't think he knew about it. I know he would have thought this was idiotic. Uh, I could give you no conceivable intellectual defense for what I did. And I call it sort of a magic we can believe in because it, it was enchanted for me. And so that's, I, I use this to say, all right, look, I give up. I don't have a religious account of this. Um, I don't really feel any kind of rational account. It just meant a lot to me. And that's kind of the foundational feeling that people have for the dead. It's so that, um, and it did. It it kind of elided World War Two. It's as if my father and my grandfather were buried in the same place as they would have been had this horrible history not not um, transpired. And there's so there's much so more much we can talk time. about. The final part of the book's about cremation. Speaking of ashes, it talks about the rise of cremation as sort of being a brand new thing on the scene uh, in terms of technological advancement and the kind of things that could be done with dead bodies. And and uh, I encourage people to check out the book and, and read that. But um, the last question I have is uh, if you could sit down yourself with Diogenes and hear him talk about his, <laughs> sort of tossing his body over the wall, what are you going to tell him now? You've done this history. Like what's your take on that? I would say, look, Diogenes, I take your point, but it's it really is an impossible point, and it's fine to live in a barrel, and maybe it's fine to be a forger, but this business of throwing the bodies over the walls and just letting them rot as garbage is just not on, and it'll never be on, and give up. <laughs> That's good. That's Tom LaCour. He is the author of The Work of the Dead, A Cultural History of Mortal Remains. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk about this book. It was a pleasure. Thank you for speaking to me. 